my collaborators and, and friends, um, Mike and Aaron here today. So um, I might just introduce each of them first and then um, we'll get into, into some Kororo or some discussion here. Uh, so Aaron um, is of Naituhoe and Natsiawa descent and currently lives in Taniatua, where she's streaming in from today, just north of Te Uruwara Rainforest, um, which was uh, vested with legal personhood in, in 2014. Um, so Erin is co-lead for River, supporting the legal, administrative, and illuminating worldviews work streams. Um, she graduated from the University of Wellington with a Bachelor of Law, Honors, and Arts, majoring in Spanish, and is passionate about regenerative community building. Um, her background has been in law and policy, working as a solicitor with Chapman Tripp in Auckland before later returning home to work for Tuhoi and serving Te Uruwara, um, her ancient rainforest, um, which she's going to tell us more about today. And Erin believes in the pathway of reconnection to Papa Tuanuku or Mother Earth, um, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and through creative expression as an active means to rebuild self, identity, and community. Um, and Erin's contracting in the areas of iwi, environmental planning, and Maori within the criminal justice, um, justice system, and is also co manager for New Zealand Alternative, um, a nonprofit organization created an informed public debate related to New Zealand's place um, and foreign policy in this changing world. And Mike, um, Mike Taitoko is of Maniapoto descent. Um, for the past 20 years, Mike's been a leading advi advisor in Maori and Indigenous economic development and has advised iwi or Maori tribes, um, government, private sector and communities with development strategies, policies and programs. Mike has an MBA with distinction from Massey University and is the co-founder of Takiwa, a data visualization and analytics company focused on integrating environmental science data with indigenous data and knowledge in order to improve decisions impacting land use and freshwater. And Mike also co-founded Toha Foundry, an impact investment platform designed to get scaled finance to the front line where environmental and climate related projects are delivering measurable impact. Um, Mike's currently leading a regenerative agriculture project in New Zealand using data visualization and farmer engagement to show where improved land practices are improving environmental outcomes, sequestering more carbon and improving business resilience. Um, and transparency of funding flows and proof of impact is designed into the program to improve transparency of impact investment outcomes. Um, so yeah, really, um, really awesome, awesome friends that I feel very, very lucky to have. Um, and I think that, yeah, with, with that, um, I'll, I might just kind of set a bit of context here um, as a, some diving board into our discussion today. Um, so I, I know that, yeah, in, in some of the films that have been um, playing so far, and I know Aaron, um, yeah, we were talking about setting a bit of context around freshwater. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to put out here that, um, as we understand it, the latest statistics is that just 2.5% of the Earth's water is freshwater, and um, globally we use approximately 70% of freshwater withdrawals for agriculture, and this percentage is higher in, in low-income countries. Um, also, almost 40% of U.S. rivers are, are considered polluted, um, and almost all of New Zealand rivers from the report released last year um, running through urban farming areas like 95 to 99% carry pollution above water quality guidelines. Um, so just in, in moving in here um, to some some debate or some not debate, but some discussion, some kororo, um, I I wanted to um, to get into sort of zooming out a little bit at, at more of the 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 reasoning for where we are, where we are. Um, today. And um, I think it's important to in, in mention that in addition to all of the praise that the Kiss the Ground film had, there was also quite a lot of criticism, especially across Turtle Island, mostly around the lack of diversity of voices and perspectives in the film, um, specifically for the lack of perspectives of Indigenous peoples and other people of color. Um, most definitely in speaking about themes like regenerative agriculture, biodiversity, conservation, and environmental law, it's pretty um, critical to recognize that these issues are enmesh enmeshed in larger complex web of ecological and social dynamics and history, um, specifically of colonialism, um, land theft, and um, the associated worldview that's kind of come with those systems that spawn the, the legal and governance systems that we now live within today. And um, Aaron, I was wondering if you could maybe speak to the evolution of um, environmental governance models beyond colonial frameworks um, that's underway um, here in Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand. Um, specifically, um, I'm sure that the audience is keen to hear about legal personhood for your your tupuna, your ancestral rainforest, um, and um, and just the the importance of um, 
of Indigenous perspectives in this space. Oh, oh well, kia ora, kia ora Jody, kia ora Thea, kia ora Mike and everybody um, watching. <laughs> it's really, really lovely to be here. It's a real privilege. So, and I will dive right in. So thanks Jody um, for all of that intro <laughs> and background. Um, yeah, we've been really lucky uh, in River to be able to learn a lot and have access to a lot of really cool minds around the world that are working in this space. So I hope I can share a little bit today about some of the things that are happening in Aotearoa. And um, yeah, if there's any questions about, uh, I welcome questions as well later because I like the, the discussion. So in terms of, yeah, our water. So as Jody was saying, our water is in dire straits. Um, and the films on New Zealand, uh, including the seven rivers walking, troubled waters and kiss the ground, they all kind of demonstrate and also the rights of nature, some of the pressures that are that are, are facing our, our water at the moment. It's undeniable. Um, there's nutrients, pathogens and sediment impacts are worsening and particularly in New Zealand in the intensive farmed areas and the urban areas. Um, New Zealand is kind of one big giant farm <laughs> at the moment. And it's kind of one of our major exports is agriculture. So um, that's kind of the biggest, the biggest uh, contributor to the worsening of our waterways. Um, what I kind of want to talk about and what an, an answer of Jody's question is, is law. And, and our, how I define law is uh, our relationships to the earth. And law is really important in this discussion because it is the tool that we can use to help care for Papa Tuanuku and help heal some of these dire circumstances that we have. But what's really important to set out in the start is that we're, our, our law at the moment is dominated by a Western worldview and Western legal systems. Um, it's so dominated that it's just considered normal um, to the point where it's like the water that we're swimming in. You're a fish in the water and you don't realize it's water until it's pointed out to you. This is the colonized reality that we're born into. And it's the Western systems of uh, law and economy and, and um, values that we just operate by because of the fact that we're just born into this normal reality. Um, so for example, you know, a bit of a shocking example, but you, we like our fresh water in our toilets, you know, it's just this wastewater, how we use it, that's just considered normal, um, that is not considered normal in, uh, in a traditional kind of persp Indigenous perspective where we relate to the land um, in a totally different way. So just to add, so I think what, what it is, in this Western legal system that, that is so damaging and has led to the destruction of, of, um, of really land and wetlands and water systems is that we are separate from the land. And you'll see this in the Rights of Nature film as well. So there's this normalcy of being disconnected from the earth. And we see this in our law as being landowners, as an example. Um, where the earth is simply our property and it is, we can trade in it, we can sell it, it just like any other household item. That's where the land is, is your title, it's your property, you have rights in relation to that property, you have rights to extract, to pollute, it's your private property. Um, and I think that concept is a really important thing to identify as just being relevant to a Western legal system where Indigenous legal systems um, which I'll talk about soon, are a different, a totally different way of relating. Um, so, if, well, I might as well say that now. So an indigenous legal system, we do not own the land. We are of the land. So the term tangata whenua, for example, is tangata is person, whenua is land, that is people of the land. Um, and in our language with water, water is why. And when we ask you, who are you? You'll say, kawai kwe. And that's a question, who are you? But if you say it as a statement, kawai kwe, it means you are water. You are water. That's how we relate to the land. And so that's how our policies, our, our, yeah, our, our policies, our regulation would have us uh, have be flowing from that grounded position of understanding this this connection it's no longer a separation it's a belonging um 
and and this is kind of also in in our in our um, Tuhui language, we have a term called mate mate aone. And mate mate aone um, basically means that one day I will be soil. So it recognizes that you're not just this person that is above the land that is separate from it and access to extract and pollute, but you are so of it, you're so intertwined in it that you will one day return to the land and you, your body will one day return to being soil and water and part of this, this landscape. So I think this is a really important uh, starting point for talking about law and talking about water and the challenges and legal personhood, because the worldview determines how we discuss, it's our starting point, how we discuss things and how we're gonna find solutions, how we identify issues and how we find solutions. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So what's really difficult for indigenous people, I think around the world and what we're finding here in Aotearoa is expressing this worldview where it's not considered myths and legends, or it's not considered kind of a quaint alternative way to see the earth um, because that's 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 part of the problem is and again it comes back to this western view being so normal that indigenous perspectives are quite like you know to the side and for the hippies <laughs> and so and particularly with our law you know and our lawmakers if you can imagine going to a, a decision making table um predominantly western uh, or like um you know, non Maori around the table, and you're trying to explain, I'm from the land, I am water, I am the river. It's a very difficult audience that's going to pick that up and say, Oh, yeah, I get it. It's, it's really hard. And it's really frustrating. And then when you see what happens to our ancestral rivers, it gets really heartbreaking as well, because you feel powerless. And so, um, so we've had to find some really creative means to declare our interests, declare our position, but within a dominant Western legal system. And so that, that takes us to um, a couple of things I wanna just uh, sort of share, which is legal personhood, which is the rights of nature. And also some of these other techniques of, you know, protesting. <laughs> so at the moment, my um, Ngāti Awa side, my Kuiga, just down the road, we're, about, we're about to go to the environment court to protect our aquifer. Um, which is under threat of becoming a, a free source of water for an international water bottling company. Um, and because of the state of the law of our water in Aotearoa, the Crown says that no one owns the water. That's the position that we take. Because if, you, if the Crown was to say, we own the water and we'll sell it to you, then Mark, it's going to, it's politically, I won't dive into this, but politically that's just really... Um, uh, incapable of doing that. So at the, at the moment in Aotearoa, no one owns the water. But the effect of that is that these international bot bottling companies can come in and pay a, uh, a, a consent fee of about 700 New Zealand dollars and then extract as much water as they can within their consent and sell it overseas. And there's no benefit at all. And really the only thing they're producing is plastic bottles. So it's just this incredibly frustrating perspective on the value of water as just this commodity, again, that can be traded like other household items, as opposed to I am the water or the water is me that I will one day be, you know, that, that, that value being so intimate and connected to our sense of self that you would never consider selling it off in that way. So in that example, it's, it shows where the worldview uh, starting point is and how that enables us to make decisions. Um, yeah. And another thing that's happened with my Natiao Fano, or actually our Matatua Fano, um, is a declaration on, on water. So um, we have basically just gathered together those of Matatua and made a Matatua declaration on water, where we assert our right to water and to care for it. We describe water as coming from the clouds, filtering through the ground, sitting in the groundwater, flowing through our rivers, the mist that arises. We identify it, we, we visualize it, and we connect to it in that way. And then we declare that we have a responsibility to care for water for our future generations. And, um, and the Modi of the water, which Modi is this, um, the life force or the this yeah the life force of the water 
Cool. All right, sweet. So, um, and, and it's an interesting time in Aotearoa as well, because we are going through re big reforms at the moment, and the Crown is starting to pick up on some of this language. So they, they don't talk, uh, they're starting to talk about Māori, um, but we're definitely talking about the mana of the water. And mana is a difficult concept to translate, um, but mana is like this uh, sense of self, sense of importance, of of strength, of, um, of value, I suppose, of the water. And so, um, yeah, our, our high level politician guys, they're weaving and, and our regional councillors and people that are in this space are weaving te mana o te wai, or this concept into our Western legal system. So we're really interested to see where that goes and what that actually looks like. Um, and that it's not just a token kind of nod to the tangata whenua of this place. Yeah. Okay, so those are some things. Now, one thing that I, I think is probably the most um, powerful is legal personhood. And um, I'm just watching the time, but I've got a couple of notes here on legal personhood and happy to take questions as well. But okay, so what the hell is legal personhood? Um, legal personhood is uh, and the rights of nature sort of intertwined. So it's where We've taken um, for Te Uruwera, the boundaries of Te Uruwera rainforest and said this rainforest is now its own legal person. So it is no longer owned by the Crown as a national park. It is not owned by Tuhoi as the tangata whenua because the concept of ownership doesn't click with our concept of being of the land. To own the land feels arrogant because in our worldview, we are the youngest children of Papa Tuanuku of the earth and would you own your mother you know it doesn't make sense to own your mother um, and it seems like she'd laugh at you for thinking that you could just be born and rock around and then claim <laughs> claim her and be her owner as if you were superior and so there's this this um and so in finding a solution this idea that Tiuruwera therefore owns herself She's vested in herself and she is given all the same rights and liabilities as a legal person. And to make that more, uh, you, like, um, so, oh, so, so in that sense, you can see that we've used a Western legal system of legislation, this tool, but we are enforcing a two-way worldview of the land owning herself and being of herself. And then under this act, two become responsible to care for Te Uruwera. So no longer um, having rights over her, but having responsibilities to care for her as a child. And so, um, yeah, and so what that looks like in, re like in the sort of practical terms is that there's a board that's been appointed to be her voice and their uh, mandate is to care for Te Uruwera, to speak on her behalf. And so her interests are the most important thing. It's not profit, like with usual companies. It's the interests of Te Uruwera, the most important thing. And it'd be, in order to be able to speak on her behalf, we have to really have a relationship with her. We have to be intimate with the land like our tifuna once were. We have to know where the berries are. We have to know about how climate change is impacting. We have to know about the insects and the moths and the birds. We just, you have to have that level of intimacy in order to be able to speak on her behalf. And so that's what we foster is that reconnection back to the whenua, the land and the water, of course. And so um, finally, the kind of enforceable act is under the act, we have a management plan, which we've called Te Kawa o Te Uruwera, just like the, the laws of Te Uruwera, the natural nature laws of Te Uruwera. And the essence of it is that we manage humans for the benefit of the land. It's not resource management. It's human management for the benefit of the land. And um, what that sort of means is that we do not assume this, um, to know so much about the land that we can manage the land. Because the land, living systems, the ecosystems of the land and the rivers, the water are so complex that they're actually beyond human perception. <laughs> and so again, it would be arrogant to then assume to be able to manage 
the land. And so, and, and then we recognize that humans are the ones putting pressure on the land. And Mike's going to talk about this too with, with our dairy and, and, and the, the reality of the impacts that we have on the whenua. And so it's not the land that needs management. She's been here for ages. She's been here way longer than we have. She knows what she's doing. <laughs> it's the humans that need management. We need to be managed. And so part of that work then is to really understand our impact from as high up as climate change to as low down as cutting a track in the forest and to understand her relation, our relationship with the whenua. Yeah, so it's about responsibility, not rights. It's about um, recognizing our place in the web of life, being very real about that. It's about love, loving, the land and recognizing her as, as part of our family, as not separate to us and loving the water and, and, and healing the water because we will not be well until the water is well. Um, so I think I might leave it there and yeah, thank you everybody. Oh, kia ora Erin, <laughs> thank you girl. Um, uh, I work with, I have the privilege of getting to work with Erin almost every day. And I still, every time, every time she, uh, she speaks, I still learn something, something new from her. Mike, I, um, I know that yesterday, Mike, um, <laughs> Prime Minister, uh, yeah, New Zealand's Prime Minister, Ardern, uh, Jacinda Ardern came out for a visit with you and your team and some of your collaborators to visit one of the farms that, that one of your project is projects is working on with and um and as we speak i understand that um that she's on a global climate finance leadership call that joe biden's or organized uh, alongside other um world leaders um and um it's yeah I, th I think just this just goes to show the the importance that that um that this issue of dangerous levels of nitrates um in, in rivers in aotearoa um, new zealand uh, has um and um uh, this, these dangerous level of nitrates in rivers were central in in two of the films that were were screened as as part of um, part of the, this film festival. Um, I'm curious, Mike, if you can speak a bit to what um, your perspectives are in regards to how how agriculture is evolving um, here in in Aotearoa in, in terms of um, integrating different ways of being, different perspectives, um, specifically Maori perspectives, and um, and what your perspectives are on how the government um, is is reacting, and if they're reacting fast enough um, in regards to freshwater uh, reform, basically for for healing of of freshwater um, in this country. <laughs> Kia ora, Mike. Kia ora, Jody Ngam Hinua Kia Koto Tena Korua Jody and Erin. Um, awesome to see you guys and. Uh, I feel like I'm getting in the way of Erin's court at all. I mean, I, I could listen to that all day. It's so important that we understand, um, you know, how we got here in the, in, in, from a legal um, standpoint, how we got to where we are today with regard to the quality of our fresh water and our agriculture and food systems, but also um, what it could look like in a world where Indigenous worldviews um, and our under, deep understanding of uh, our connection and relationship to, to the land and to nature and to Papa Tuanuku, um, if we understood that more deeply, and I'm not just talking about Indigenous people, but I'm talking about every, every human on the planet, understood that, then maybe we'd be making better decisions even within the kind of the, the existing legal and governance systems and frameworks that we kind of have to operate within. But And thank you, Fia, for organising this um, hui and some of its, its really important co -papas. So So um, stoked to be here. Um, look, thank you, Jody. I guess just a, a little bit of background. Um, I spent you know, a good part of 20 years working with the tribes, iwi and Māori organisations and government around policy, around um, iwi and Māori economic development, did some work up in the Pacific. And um, during that time, we learned a lot about um, the how difficult it is to take an, a Western policy framework and Western governance systems dropping down into policies and programs to find ways to pro fund programs and support communities where um, those communities by and large saw the world through a different lens that, than the ones that were trying to create these models and programs out of. And so we, we just saw these massive mismatches between that kind of top-down Western governance view of the world and what policy needs to look like versus the actual 
uh, solutions on the ground that citizens and communities that Fano and Iwi and um, Hapu were creating for themselves. And uh, it led me to um, down a path of starting to look at the data and information that government sat on in order to make decisions for us and about us without kind of getting into our world enough to understand what kind of enduring um, successful solutions, policy solutions and outcomes could look like. And so we thought by taking that data and information, maybe we could use that to um, inform ourselves about what it could look like. And if we could be better informed about what the solutions could look like, then maybe we could get the government to fund some of this stuff so we didn't have, we could just take the idea, the policy solutions to them, get them to fund it and life will be good, we can carry on. The, it, unfortunately though, um, I was probably a bit naive, it doesn't work like that, right? Um, and so what we realized was that no matter what we presented up in terms of here are solutions, these are working, we can see it right now, we've got the data, we've got the evidence, there's a limited body of knowledge and science to support this because the science hasn't been done in this space. But we have you know, hundreds and thousands of years of, of science and, and tradition of whakapapa and stories, our genealogy um, and our, the, the oral traditions are, are solid, they're robust and they carry us down through, you know, back to you know, over a thousand years and they're precise with pinpoint accuracy. So we know what works and what doesn't work. Um, the problem is when we try to articulate that into a Western science view as well as a Western policy view, it kind of falls flat. And so we use, took the data and said, well, if we can use the tools that the government has at their fingertips and at their disposal, and we can bring it together with the tools that we have, then maybe we can work out different ways of trying to understand this and, and, and fund the things that we know need to be done. And on that journey, we found ourselves a, um, a lot. We, we worked in health sector, education, um, at commerce, cross, right across the spectrum. But the area we kept coming back to time and time again was the tension between the uh, degrading and declining fresh water quality and the impact that our land and agricultural sectors were having on freshwater quality. And so we got quite good at looking at uh, using, you know, set, whether it's satellite data or in situ um, hardware sensors to get 24 seven lab quality data out of the rivers. Um, we started having to invest ourselves in learning what the challenges were, how big this problem was because the government knows how serious this freshwater challenge is for the country. 75% um, of our native fish are on the edge of extinction. Over 90% of our wetlands are gone to agriculture. Um, over 60% of our rivers are unswimmable. Um, we know how big this problem is. Um, and so the, the question is, is to our government, and Jody's question is, is the government moving fast enough? Looping this back to the start, what Eric was, Aaron was talking about, I think New Zealand's, Aotearoa New Zealand's in a prime position to lead the world and getting the right balance between our indigenous worldviews and a Western worldview and drive that into a new policy framework that starts to solve these problems. But we've got some work to do. Is the government moving fast enough? Um, no, short answer, no. It can't possibly be moving fast enough because we're still not seeing um, enough policy and, an, um, and enough ac action coming in to find ways to stop the rapidly declining and ongoing declining state of our fresh water. So I'll give you an example. So we've got a co-governance group that's been set up to look after and invest in the remediation of our largest river, the Waikato River. It's hugely important to all our iwi. There's six iwi, uh, six tribes uh, live along that river. Uh, it's got um, power stations on it, it's got wastewater flowing into it, it's got um, industrial waste going into it, uh, and it, and the level of degradation from the top of that river where it comes out almost pristine to the bottom where it's um, it's almost mu it's muddy in appearance and it's highly polluted. Um, it's a real, you know, some real tangible data points along the way to show you where and why and how it got, got so bad. So now you've got a governance group that's uh, a co-governance group that's formed between the tribes and the government uh, and the government through regional councils that spends about six million dollars a year on remediation activities on that river, which is a positive thing. So this is the opportunity to get our co-governance, our relationships right between the Crown and, and Māori. However, while uh, sitting in a boardroom trying to organise how to spend that six million dollars each year on the things that are going to make the biggest difference. 
the regional councils flying helicopters up and down that river spraying a chemical called metsulfurin on the alligator weed on the side of the river. Now the alligator weed is boosted by the nitrates running off the dairy farms. And that, that metsulfurin is an ecotoxin and it's highly poisonous to the aquatic life in the river. So the things that Erin's talking about are absolutely, I think, critical for the world to start embracing how we bring together our indigenous worldviews and, and Western worldviews into a policy framework and legal framework that helps us make better decisions where we can carry on our daily lives, but not at the harm, not, at, not, not in a way that's harming nature, our environment, our water, our land, the way it currently is. Um, how do we, we can put all these things in place, but if our, if our uh, regulators are still allowing helicopters to fly up and down the river that we care so deeply about, that is us, I am the river, the river is me. There is no separation for us. And we continue, we know 75% of our native fish are on the edge of extinction and these chemicals are killing our native fish. Then we're actually wasting our money on a co-governance arrangement trying um, carry out remediation projects on the river and so there's a there, I believe Aotearoa is going to be a world leader in our in our governance arrangements in the future but right now um, are we moving fast enough no we're not are we moving in the right direction yes we are um, and and so the day those helicopters stop flying up the, up and down that river and the day our wetlands stop being dug up and we start the, the good news is we can return our wetlands we can get those chemicals out of our system. We can stop the decline of, and, and the extinction of our native fish. We can stop that, but we have to stop it now. We can't wait. And so we've got some big challenges ahead. So having the Prime Minister come out to one of our farms yesterday was a really big, um, it was a, a, a really big signal from our leadership, from government, that the idea of regenerative agriculture um, is something that our government needs to start taking seriously, but it butts head up into the head, head first into the headwinds of our dominant industrialised um, agriculture sector. And so the fact that she came with her Agri Minister of Agriculture and a couple of other ministers um, uh, was a huge signal that, that she's uh, starting to take it seriously. And we know she, she was on the Joe Biden, um, the 40 world leaders talking about climate finance this morning. Um, and so our Prime Minister is looking for ways through this and we're really happy to help her in that regard. Um, so, uh, but again, the proof will be in the pudding. It won't be until we see legislation and policy continue to come out of government that supports the escalation, the scaling up of regenerative agriculture across Aotearoa. And so just to finish on that, um, what, we, um, what we showed her, we talk about nitrates. So in some of our regions, we've got nitrogen level, nit nitrate levels in our fresh water, in our drinking water that exceed the WHO thresholds and have done for over 10 years in certain areas. And those nitrate levels uh, um, are, are occurring because of the levels of nitrogen and irrigation going onto our dairy farms. It's as easy as that. And so we know, we understand that. We can see where those farms are. We can see the, the, sort, the, the pin where that water sampling has been taken from. We can see the irrigation irrigators where that, those samples are being taken from and we can see the pipes that come out that, that take it to drinking water. So we know where the problem is and we know how big it is. And so the farm we showed her yesterday was a highly, highly successful dairy farm. They've destocked by about 15%, so they've got some of their cows off. They're using zero synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. They're using biological principles and processes and uh, they're profitable, and that it's the it's you know we've got farmers up and down the country now who are experiencing joy back into farming again, and so um, just to finish, here's what we're seeing. We're seeing Pakeha white farmers standing in paddocks, saying that they have connected and reconnected with the land, and that they understand when they see their fresh water now what fresh water means and why land is important to to iwi and Māori because a lot of these people are close to us in physically but not close to us in terms of world views a lot of people still don't understand how we see through what we see through our eyes but they're starting to reconnect and when i listen to them talk i see white people pakia and i say this to them sometimes they sound more maori than some maori i know the way they talk about their connection to nature 
They won't tell their mates this, but they're happy to tell me this. Their connection to nature, when they're feeling a little bit tired or kind of a little bit stressed starts to kick in, which isn't as often as what it used to be when they were running chemical and high intensive processes. One of them said, I'll go and lie in that paddock over there and tune back in again, right? And this is new for this is new for these guys. It's not new for us. And so the most amazing transition that I'm starting to see right now is our whanaunga, our Pākehā whanaunga across Aotearoa starting to reconnect in a way that we understand is important for us. And now can you see how important it is for you? And they're saying, of course we can. How could we have got it so wrong? And so my hope is, is that at a legislative and regulatory level, the sorts of work that Erin's involved in and a lot of people are involved in around the rights of nature and our legal frameworks in order to boost that from both an, an Indigenous and a Western world view, we continue to drive those strategies. But on the ground, we continue to support the people that we're seeing right now saying, you know what, I'm done with industrialised agriculture, high intensive farming. I'm out back to biological ways of doing things. And the unintended consequence for them is they're starting to understand our role on this planet. And it is not to extract at all cost to make as much money as quickly as we can, because that hasn't worked for them. And so I'm going to finish it there, um, Jody. I think we're on the right track, but uh, I think we're running out of time. So um, mm. uh, I'll, I'll, you started with mentioning Kiss the Ground and some of the pushback it got. I, I watched it from an Indigenous and Māori perspective. I really liked the movie because I saw it for what it was. It was a group of people through their lens trying to communicate as best as they could the seriousness of what we're faced with. The lens that they looked at it through was their lens. I didn't look at it as them trying to say anything other than we've got a problem. We need to communicate to as many people as we can what that problem is. Sure, there's Indigenous and, and um, people of colour and um, all sorts of different worldviews that are being impacted on industrialised agriculture right, right now. But we've also got our own voice and we need to stand up as Indigenous people and say, we've had enough. There's another way to do this. Let's just get on with it. So, kia ora. Kia ora, Mike. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Mike. Yeah, always love hearing about your your work. Um, yeah, just you're you're very close to the ground in in that way, and I think you you yeah have a unique role there, kind of in, in between sort of these kind of higher level policy decision making and and then your time on farms. So it's really really interesting to hear from you, and just yeah, just um. Love your your work, and and when we get to hear about Probably it, Jen. and yeah, and thank you so so much, Mike. And I think um, another film that I, I think it, that um, I've heard from, from from some friends in Turtle Island that that does do a good job about talking about some some of the Turtle Island Indigenous perspectives on on our food systems is the film Gather, um, which I'm looking really forward to to viewing at at some point as well. Um, I was hoping that maybe um, with both of you, and I'm not sure if you still got a few more minutes here as well, Mike. Yeah, sure. I've got. I've actually got 15 minutes, Jody. I'm sorry. I'm on another panel shortly, um, so I've oh. kind of over. over <laughs> yes. No. No. No worries. Um, well, I was hoping that for both Aaron and Mike, I, I was, I was wondering, wondering if you can maybe talk um, a bit about. Um, about maybe some of your own experiences with this this concept, at, at least in, in Canada, that um, that we re refer to as as two eyed seeing. Um, so this concept of two eyed seeing, which um, Mi'kmaq elder um, our Albert Marshall um, largely originated, um, means to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous ways of knowing, and to see from the other eye with the strengths of Western ways of knowing, and to use both of these eyes together. Um, I mean, one of the papers about two-eyed seeing, um, they explain that two-eyed seeing involves not integrating, but weaving knowledge so that each way of seeing maintains its own integrity while enhancing perspective and broadening understanding. Um, I was wondering if, if, uh, if maybe you could each speak to this. Um, Aaron, in your perspective as, as a lawyer, um, I, I think something um, that strikes me as an example of this, of this is with the, um, the friendship agreements, maybe replacing um, traditional licenses um, in, in Te Kawa Uti Urwera um, management plan. And, and Mike, I'd be keen to hear if there um, 
are any um, any examples that you can think of where uh, any practices where where you feel like uh, two eyed seeing or um, I've also heard of it referred to as he awafiria I think in in Māori or we we've woven rivers braided rivers um, yeah where where this um, where this concept of of two ways of of being is is being held in, in kind of an, an ethical space. Um, yeah, keen to, to hear any thoughts there. Cool. Um, I'll give Mike a, Mike a break. <laughs> I'll jump back in for a second. Um, yeah, thanks, Jodie. I think two-eyed seeing is a really useful phrase for this concept because it's inclusive and it's not drawing lines between, you know, um, Pākehā or, or um, non-Māori and Māori or Indigenous and non-Indigenous it actually allows us to see the strengths like you're saying and and really combine combine the efforts and the tools that we have to actually do some good um, and reverse some of the some of the bad so that's why I really like two-eyed seeing I don't think it's useful to be us versus them all the time I think it's really important to understand each other and uh, understand our worldviews um, the friendship agreements is an interesting one it's um, it's essentially like a, a commercial arrangement. So maybe not the best example, but I, I have another example. But just on that, essentially with Teuruwira, you can imagine she owns herself. She's her own legal person. And there are some people that want to go into the forest for commercial purposes. So taking tourists in there or taking, um, I don't know, horse treks or... Um, yeah, all, so, all sorts of hunting expeditions where they actually make money whilst in Te Uruwira. And so um, before Te Uruwira Act, um, before we changed the law, when she was a park, a national park, there would be concessions. And so the commercial outfit would just pay dollars to um, DOC or the crown entity that looked after Te Uruwira, and that would be how it is. But under Te Kawa Te Uruwira, we have what we say friendship agreements. So essentially what you're saying to these people who are coming in to use that space is that you need to be a friend to Te Uruwira. So I don't just want your fee. It's not about transaction. It's about your recognition that she is in and of herself valuable, that you are actually making, you know, you are benefiting from your relationship there. How are you going to be a friend back? What are you going to contribute how are you going to talk about these things? So, and, and really examining what does friendship mean? It's reciprocal, you know, it's really caring. It's, it's, it's got longevity. It's not just a quick transactional relationship. It's an ongoing understanding of each other and, and communication with each other. So I think that's a really, um, oh man, it is a really good example. Thanks, Judy. Um, the other example I just wanted to share about this two I'd seeing was one from Natiawa, where we had, um, through our sawmills, we had contaminated a lot of our land and that had actually washed into our rivers. And they had this awful phrase of what's the solution to pollution is dilution, <laughs> something like that. So you just dilute the toxins that you're pushing into the river by allowing it to swim out to the ocean and dilute. And then that would be the solution. And um, obviously that's from a perspective of extraction so we can make dollar bills and be rich and successful <laughs> and it doesn't take into account the cost to the earth. It's, it's really, really, um, really limited in its concept of economy. And so uh, we had this, so basically um, the sawmill workers, this is back about over 30 years now, but they were using this stuff called pentachloralphenol, which is um, a toxin that you use to, to douse, you douse timber, pine into it, and it makes it really hard. So it's a much more, um, I don't know, useful piece of wood. But our men, our men were doing this, and it's a relation, it's a relate related to Agent Orange, this chemical and the dioxins that it produces. And so you can imagine that over time our men were being poisoned. Um, and then the land and the water was being poisoned by wasting this stuff. And so we ended up with these huge amounts of contaminated land that leach into the, uh, into the sea. And the most common way to remediate this is to dig it up and take it to a dump site and just dump it there. And for Natiawa, that's that was felt, and I imagine for others, really offensive because now you've gone and polluted this this, this soil, this land, and now you're just treating it like a waste product and you're throwing it in someone else's, 
uh, rohe or someone else's part, we would be throwing it to Waikato, which for us was unacceptable. And so this two-eyed seeing, what we did was say, no, we have to remediate it where it is. And we want for Papa Tuanuku to heal herself. And then we had these Western scientists come with myco, um, myco remediation and phyto remediation, which is fungi and trees. And they took these soil examples and they put all this fungi in it and then they planted a tree on it and it managed to remediate the soil by 85% in one case. And so in that sense, that's a two-eyed seeing approach of um, finding an issue that is really serious. You know, if you were to plant a garden on that land, you would be poisoning yourself. Um, and remediating the soil using papatuanuku or the earth. And so I, I found that in that, in that project, the, the Ngātiawa people and the Western science trained people were really able to find this wonderful middle ground of starting from a place of, no, we need papa to be well, and then using the tools of the West to really achieve some amazing results. Um, so I think those sorts of things, those projects are really exciting. And the one thing I just need as a risk is that when the science works, the risk is that the council goes, oh, sweet, and then takes the science and then justifies the science and forgets about the starting point of that relationship with the land. Um, and that's, you know, something that does happen where it's sort of, you just disconnect it again and you kind of throw away to the side. And so it's really important that our decision makers and our policy writers and all these people that are in these decisions start to learn about and value the Indigenous perspective because that's where the driver comes from and it's way wider. So just to finish, another impact of this remediation is also looking at the, the intergenerational nature of that project. So not only was it about healing um, Papa Tuanuku, but it was about training up young young people to be able to do this over time as well. And that was part of the environmental result of this project that needed to be valued. So it's way when you when you look at indigenous perspectives and you marry them with Western science, you end up with a far more holistic approach to solution making, way more creative. And um, yeah, and I like what Mike was saying about having um, Pākehā people feeling this, this new connection and being able to recognise that and feel that in their bodies, because that is when you get to a point where it's not just an intellectual understanding of Indigenous perspective, but a heart felt, a body felt, a gut felt understanding, a deep understanding of those things, which is really where the change starts to happen, because it's it means something. It's not just, oh, that's nice, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, that's probably... Wow. Powerful, powerful examples there of, of two-eyed seeing. Um, yeah, no, really excited to, to share those at, at home as well. R really powerful examples. Um, Mike, anything to add to add there that you've seen in an, from an agriculture perspective? Oh, I think you're muted there, Mike. <laughs> well, before the agriculture thing, my two eyes seeing is this my mum and my dad. So my dad grew up. He's Māori, he was Māori, grew up only speaking Māori, couldn't speak English. And my mum's Pākehā, she's got English um, ancestry. And so we grew up in a two-eyes seeing household. And we saw the good and the bad of kind of the Western European culture and, uh, and the Māori and Indigenous culture as well. And it was just amazing. And it kind of meant that we grew up on this bridge between two worlds. And mum and dad loved each other deeply, but there was always this kind of tension that we could look at from almost standing back and under, and we grew up understanding both as much as we could, but it's really hard for them to understand as much what the, how the others are thinking or seeing things because their worlds that they grew up in were quite different. And so if you think about my dad and, and a lot of people, a lot of my um, colleagues and mates my age, our parents were the ones who grew up um, who could only speak Māori until they got to school and then they would get the, get strapped or, you know, get kicked out of the classroom if they wouldn't, if they didn't speak English. And so that whole colonisation process designed to um, uh, kill off our language, that, that was my dad as a five-year-old walking into a classroom for the first time getting strapped because he couldn't, didn't speak English. So, 
seeing what he had to adjust to growing up and and then uh, learning that we are grow me growing up with him and 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 seeing how that played out in real life and then seeing what it was like for my mum was an amazing way of just kind of seeing where, where we've come from how we got to where we are today but what a new future might look like if we have a better understanding of that so for me the the two eyes seeing is probably is probably what I said before around agriculture and farming. Is it about our different cultures and worldviews trying to understand each other and kind of almost force ourselves into understanding it? Or is it about all of our cultures trying to understand how nature works? Because I think once we understand, once we all understand how nature works and 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 where we fit into that, that we are part of nature then maybe it's the guidance we take from nature that shows us what many eyes seeing looks like. Because at that point we have, we've, we've, we're not separate anymore. And I don't mean not separate from each other. I mean, we're not separate from the reason we're here and kind of what we're here to do for the short time we're here. And so for me, the two eyes seeing, I think is, is a super um, cool concept. But imagine if it was the eyes that were uh, that were able to see things through the eyes of nature. And we no longer need a seat at the board for, to protect nature because everyone is nature. Uh, and so that's kind of a, the ideal world for me. But again, you know, we've got big crises in the midst of huge climate crisis and freshwater crisis and COVID. And then, you know, there's more pandemics coming. So... You know, the sooner we find ways to accelerate the change in mind, the mind shift that's required uh, globally, um, the better. And uh, it's hard to see where it's coming from um, around the world, but I can certainly say hand on heart, I think um, we've got a long way to go here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but I really feel like I can finally say that, you know, with this Prime Minister and, and with some of the leadership we have, and certainly with our tribal, our iwi leadership, it feels like we're heading in the right direction. But, um, you know, there's an urgency that here now in front of us that, you know, we've let this go on for too long. We've got to get cracking. So wherever we have the opportunity to um, get together with our Indigenous uh, whanaunga, our cousins and brothers and sisters around the world to help find ways to boost this um, transition, then... Um, then that, that would be an awesome thing. So it's certainly something we're pre pretty committed to working on. Mm. Oh, kia ora, Mike. Um, thanks, thanks so much for that. Um, no, I, I love um, you love what you've added there. And I think that it's interesting in the term of multi-eyed seeing, this is something that yeah, Aaron and I have been talking a lot about with David McConville, um, an, another member of our, our River crew. Um, yeah, and just the um, the, the basis of I, I think I love when Aaron talks about the basis of of natural natural law of <clears throat> of nature's laws um, really being being the basis of of how we construct our, our human laws and um, yeah. Can yeah. I just add one, one more thing to that, Jody? And that is um, I've just shown you a photo of my mum and dad, right? Maori Pakia and. In the Western world, we fractionalize our our our, gen our ancestry. You're a quarter of this. You're half that. You're one eighth, whatever. You don't have a right to that because you're not your fraction. Is it your ratio isn't high enough? But one of our um, uh, esteemed Kaumato, as one of our elders here in Aotearoa, said said uh, that uh, if you have one drop of Maori blood flowing through your veins, you're as much Maori as anybody else. And I think that's. That's the a distinction or an example of the different ways we see see the world. Is that sure? Of course, you can fractionalize um, your genetics, but from an indigenous and uh, worldview, it doesn't matter what that fraction is. It's irrelevant because you have that ounce in you that's flowing through your veins. It gives you every right to be who you are, and you define for yourself who that is. And don't and we can't let anyone else tell us any other way. So I just wanted to give an example of where kind of we think about the, how we see the world. Mm. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thanks for, yeah, for, for adding that in there. And I think this actually flows um, quite well into, into um, Brian Forrest's question here. Um, Brian writes, um, with the destruction white men wrought on nature, what does white culture bring to the healing process? And um, I think Brian, I, I would I would suggest um, within our River Crew, one of our main work streams is is this illuminating worldviews work stream, and 
Um, we've got some some collaborators um, there, like uh, yeah, David McConville and Sarah Jolina Walcott, who really um, focus on on some of the deep deep history um, of uh, of this kind of he healing work um, in in the West. And um, I know um, I there's a, a few links that we can send through here to um, a symposium we had a few weeks ago where where we were digging in, um, looking at some of the, where some of these underlying, this underlying history and, and uh, values come from and the, you know, the complex diversity of, of traditions of the West um, and, you know, and, and the history of, of colonization of, of earth-based cultures and in, in Europe and everything like that. Um, Aaron, I might just hand it to you here. Um, Aaron's been taking Sarah Jolina Wolcott's um, course, um, which dives into some of these, these kind of complex dynamics, so. I think it's a good question, actually, and um, and I think it picks up on what Mike's saying about this this concept of how we identify ourselves, and really how we identify ourselves also speaks to how we relate to the world around us, to each other, how we relate to each other, and how we relate to the land, and to our history, how we relate to our history, and I, I tie that into law because that's what law is really um, talking about is is how we relate to, to each other. And in reality, we just have space. We just have to share space and we have time that passes. And those are the two very real things that occur in our environment. And we are all nature. And I think with this, um, with what Jody's talking about, um, the illuminating worldviews, it's about really starting to understand the origins of where we've all come from and the consequences of those things. So I find this um, exploring the Western perspective has been extremely useful for identifying how we've come to be dominated by these ideologies of separation and superiority to the land. And once we start to understand where these ideas came from and the impacts and the consequences of it, then we can start to say, oh, we don't have to be like that. Actually, I want to understand um, another creation story. Essentially, I want to understand um, how I do relate to the land. So um, yeah, with, with your question, it kind of made me think about this idea that humans are just this parasite on the earth and that we're, we're these awful pests that, you know, need to, we just should all just get wiped out so the earth can like continue to breathe and stuff. And I, I understand that sentiment, <laughs> like, but I also think um, that we are, like what Nate, Mike was saying, we are nature though. And we are the children of the earth. So our bodies are earth. You know, our bones are made up of the same minerals in the earth. We are water. We are biologically, historically, we are from this earth. And the earth loves us. You know, that, that parent, that child parent relationship is, is real. It's different from the human parent child, but it's, it's still that she, her love for us is still plentiful despite our own actions, our naughtiness, our, our arrogance. Um, I, I, that's proved to me in my own garden, you know, like just down the road, our, our river's poison. And yet in my own garden, she's giving me bountiful food that I can share with my, my friends. I can plant seeds and she, she grows these things for me and she feeds me. And, and so that, that relationship and appreciation, I think everyone can feel that you don't have to be indigenous to feel that. And I think that actually the term indigenous it's a controversial point, but if we're all of the land, you know, we are all of the land. You, Brian, you didn't come from space. <laughs> like, oh, you, you are stardust, but you didn't like land here. We're all from, so there's no distinction between Indigenous and non-Indigenous in terms of that. It's really our ideologies and, and that's our worldview. That's, that's where the conversation needs to come through. So I don't see the white man as the enemy. I see the an ideology of separation and disconnection and arrogance and as the enemy. Um, that's what needs to be known and understood and dismantled. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's interesting. All these conversations about water and land come back to our identity and our relationships. It really does, because that's how we, how, that's how we've been existing, you know? That's how we've been making these decisions and causing all this ruckus. <laughs> Thanks, girl. I, 
Yeah, thanks for what, what you've added there. And I think that it just, um, there's a, uh, one of your, um, your proverbs that you share sometimes um, about that you walk forward looking back into the past. And I think this just, um, yeah, this just demonstrates the, the importance of, I think, of, of, um, of as we move forward, of looking back and, and, of, and of really, um, really deeply examining and um, making reparations for those, the, that historical trauma, that this, this has to be a part of it, of, uh, of the way that we move, move forward in these, these arenas. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know the proverb itself, but it's, I walk forward, maybe you, <laughs> you know it. Oh, I think you're muted oh, there. Yeah, it's, um, so we walk backwards into the future with our eyes fixed on the path, the past. And that's because the future is still unknown. It's behind us, but the past is, and our ancestors are in front of us. We can see all of that and learn from that. And as we walk backwards, we take that with us. That's the idea. So yeah, thanks for raising that. That's a cool, cool way to summarize those.